Now, we've seen that Locke does not want to accept uh, innate speculative principles like logic. We saw that in a previous video, and that would be in uh, Book 1, Chapter 2. In this video, we're still in Book 1, we're moving on to Chapter 3, and we're watching Locke build his argument against innate principles in general. But as he did uh, the innate, uh, shall we say, the speculative, the logical, he went against those in the previous chapter. In this chapter, he wants to say there are no innate practical principles. For practical principles, think moral principles, like moral rules, moral laws, like, you know, don't, don't kill, don't, don't uh, uh, do bad things or whatever. So that's what he's talking about when he talks about practical principles. And we will have to clarify these because we have, according to Locke, certain, as he says, nature impressed upon us certain natural inclinations. But what he's really driving at is not, again, not that we are, when we're born, we're just absolutely just complete blank slates. Got to be careful about that one. But we don't have knowledge when we're born. So then when Locke's talking about uh, principles, he's talking about like knowledge of ways of behaving. We may have natural inclinations to go after certain things and avoid certain things, but that's not the same thing. An inclination isn't the same thing as knowledge. So remember, all this is no innate knowledge, whether they be in the form of uh, speculative principles or practical ones. Now, so a little recap from the Locke picks up and he says, look, think, think about the logical principle that it's impossible for X, whatever X is, to exist and simultaneously not exist. That principle it's, is, as we've seen, it doesn't have universal consent because children wouldn't, uh, wouldn't consent to it. They don't know about it. But is there any moral principle as likely for universal consent as this? And Locke says no. So not only is it the case that logical principles do not command universal assent, moral principles are even further away from likely commanding universal assent. So Locke says, however, just because they're quote unquote further away from commanding assent or universal assent, moral principles are just as true as logical ones. So it doesn't mean that they're less likely to be true or anything like that. It's just that moral principles, more than logical principles, need to be grounded on experience and reason. Locke doesn't think that uh, logical principles are going to be grounded like that. But still, you're not born knowing logical principles. So moral principles, again, why don't uh, uh, people really know them? Well, a lot of people don't even bother to look into them. So Locke is, is also running a commentary on, uh, shall we say, a sociological commentary on how we behave, how we act, and how we also think about uh, the principles that we use to govern our behavior. Once again, you're not born with any of these things. Sure, Locke gives the example of, of some people say, well, look, uh, even robbers, you know, so his little example of, of robbers, will act as a team, right? Doesn't that suggest that if even the people that we would say, well, the bad guys will act morally, they'll act together, they'll cooperate. Is, isn't it sort of like acting together? They might get it wrong or whatever, but uh, acting together as a team. So even bad people uh, will act according to moral principles, like on, like, you know, you should cooperate. Doesn't that suggest that those are maybe innate? And Locke says, well, no, not really. Because, you know, if some, if a group acts, a, if, a, if a, a number of individuals act as a team to rob and cheat and steal, Locke says that's pretty far-fetched to say that they're acting according to some innate moral principle. They could just be acting simply out of uh, their own self-interest or their own uh, desires or, or whatnot. This really is a stretch to call that an innate moral principle. So these are just rules of convenience. So don't confuse simple rules of convenience that most people will act according to with something like a, an innate moral principle. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, Locke admits nature did impress upon us inclinations. So we do have, there are natural inclinations. Things you don't necessarily learn. But that's not 
anything more, shall we say, spectacular than uh, when a, a newborn baby uh, emerges into the world and, uh, and the umbilical cord is cut, and then all of a sudden the lungs kick into gear, right? That the baby all of a sudden starts breathing. The baby doesn't learn how to breathe. So that's, again, that's a natural inclination of the respiratory system to kick into gear once uh, the umbilical cord is cut. And there's no learning process. You couldn't learn how to breathe because uh, uh, you, you would die. Your body wouldn't be able to have oxygen. So there are certain things that you, can, that you have to have a capacity to do. So that you have a capacity to lean towards uh, things that are helpful towards you or, or helpful for you or beneficial. And then you try to avoid things that are bad for you. Locke says those are the impressed uh, inclinations uh, of nature. So that's, again, those are not moral principles, though. Those are just inclinations, right? Same thing like puppies and children and all have, we all have inclinations. But don't think that's knowledge. Remember, Locke is not saying anything more than we don't have innate knowledge. Um, Locke also says, and so in the rest of this chapter, he goes through a number of arguments that people have in favor of innate uh, moral principles. So, I'm going to list a few of them and give you Locke's uh, responses to them. So, for instance, think of moral, any moral principle. So, the rob, uh, we looked at the robber as a team. That doesn't, that doesn't work. How about this one? Think of, uh, uh, Locke says that any moral principle, any moral principle Z, anyone you want to come up with, you can ask, you can ask legitimately for Z's justification. So, if you say things like, well, my, I have a moral principle, uh, uh, you know, like, keep your promises, right? So that seems to be a good one. Moral principle, for example. Keep your promises. There you go. There's a good, there's a good Zed. Keep your promises. Locke is saying that unlike this logical law where un impossible for X to exist and not exist, you can always ask for the justification of moral principles. You, if you said, why is it impossible or I want that justified, Locke would think that that's kind of an odd question. Right? But the fact is that for any moral principle, you can always say, well, why should I do that? Locke says that in, in this case, the moral principle is not the starting point of reasoning, it's a product of reasoning. Hence, for moral principles, you show their truth via experience and reasoning. So moral principles are the products of reasoning. They're not the foundations of reasoning like logical principles are. So in that sense, uh, we would use uh, an argument to get to a moral principle. And of course, what arguments are we going to use? Well, how to get, so this is, shall we say, this is a result of, of reasoning. And of course, keep your promises well. If you ask people, uh, uh, do you think it's a good idea to keep your promises? Most people would say, yes, that's a good moral principle, a good guideline to live by. And then if you said, okay, do you think it's reasonable to ask for a justification for that principle? Yeah, sure. Well, what do you think? Well, as Locke says, Christians are going to tell you one story. People who follow the philosopher uh, Hobbes will give you another story. They're all leading to the same conclusion, keep your promises, but they're going to give you different uh, uh, explanations uh, for the maxim keep your or the rule or the speculative or the sorry the uh, uh, practical principle of keep your promises you'll get all different kinds of stories or arguments leading up to it and Locke says well given that we can always ask rationally for a justification and given that we get different explanations that lead to this Locke says highly unlikely, it seems pretty rich, seems pretty doubtful that uh, keep your promises is innate. So this isn't going to work either. So because you can always ask for Zed's justification and you get different uh, responses, looks like this isn't going to work either. Uh, moral principles uh, 
uh, still, it's, it seems that, well, they're, they're the results, they're products. Now, be careful though, because Locke is not, all, because Locke himself is not always careful when he talks. For instance, he does think that ultimately morality is grounded in the nature of God. So for Locke, moral principles, moral reasoning ultimately is supported at the end of it all by God. Right, so we don't get there by just like God didn't allow us to get to His principles via just stamping them on our minds. He didn't do that. God gave us reason and experience by which we can eventually get to God's principles. So Locke does say that look, God exists, no question there. Grant that uh, he thinks we can prove it. Also, we'll talk about that in other sections of the essay. But for now, Locke is definitely saying, "Yep, God exists. God created us. Uh, God also um, yoked virtue, right? How you should behave, the right thing to do. God yoked that to the public good. So when you behave in the right ways, you're contributing to the public good. So what's good for you? What's really moral?" ultimately, and the way you should behave also will contribute to the public good. God brought those two things together. Many philosophers have debated about, you know, what's good and moral and what's good for me may not uh, work well for the public. How do we put, shall we say, personal virtue and public virtue together? Locke is very clear. He said, we don't have to do it. God did it already. All right. So uh, again, Locke goes on to other, if other uh, arguments and you know and he says things like well if moral principles were innate um, could we just break them so easily people break moral rules all over the place come on if they're innate really that people would break them like crazy Locke says uh, um, you know I, I, I doubt it. it it's it's this just seems very doubtful yeah, he says it might be the case that individuals will break an innate law, law allows some wiggle room. So let's say human beings have moral laws stamped on their souls and the odd human being, um, not, not in general, but the once in a while somebody breaks that rule, okay. But he says, really, look it, you, you, you can provide whole cultures. Now, this is something, don't exactly talk but like this today, but Locke does. And he gives examples of, uh, you can go through the, through the text, he gives examples of various cultures doing terrible things like fattening and eating their children. So Locke, you know, kind of pulls an old sort of move out of, uh, out of Herodotus by showing, you know, cultural relativism. And he says, look, if you've got cultures that do things where the whole culture does something that uh, seems to at least us morally reprehensible, is that likely? Is that likely going to happen that a whole culture would do that? And yet the moral principle that we say, like, don't eat your children, is you know, impressed upon our souls, wouldn't it be impressed upon theirs? And they're all breaking it. The whole culture is breaking a, a moral rule that's impressed upon their, the, its soul, uh, the collective number of souls. Locke says again, pretty far-fetched. Individual bad people, no problem. But whole bad societies and you, the innate hypothesis, those don't seem to work. It seems much easier to say something like, wow, those people over there that do those things that are bad, they're, they're they're, maybe they're misreading their experience. Maybe their reasoning is flawed rather than trying to say, yeah, they're going against uh, all the, Im the uh, divinely impressed or innate uh, spec uh, moral principles on their souls. So Locke says, no, I, I doubt it. So Locke also has a nice little discussion about what about culture? Okay. Maybe it's the case that we have innate ideas, and some of these arguments here that he does in book, or in book one, chapter three, will be very similar to those that he used in uh, book one, chapter two. So you can, you can see that Locke repeats a lot of arguments, and he just applies them now to culture. But his argument goes like this. What if someone says something like this? Look, culture is the culprit, right? Maybe culture, shall we say, covers up distorts, corrupts, 
that is you're born, you've got all these nice things stamped on your soul, and then that nasty culture uh, and, and education, maybe they're the culprit, right? So maybe it's the case that education and culture ruin human beings, kind of like Rousseau tried to, uh, uh, tried to argue in a certain way. But maybe that's the problem, is, is, is culture and education, that's a corrupting force. What about that? Could that go that? Locke drags out another argument, drags out an argument we saw earlier. Well, if it's the case that that little kids are so wonderful, uh, or at least you would think that if it's all stamped in, all the good stuff is stamped in, it's innate, and then culture comes along and ruins it, well, then children should be the closest to all these good things. So wouldn't your children be the most kindest, most moral, most reasonable? Locke says anyone who's hung around with children knows that that's not the case. Children's minds, uh, although they might be the least affected by education and culture, don't seem to be the most moral and rational. Right? They will actually seem the opposite. How often do we say to, to, to small children, use your words, you know, don't fight, try to get along, etc., etc. So Locke, uh, based on some observations of children, says, ah, this one's not going to work either. So again, arguments are put forward in favor of innate moral principles. Locke tries to tear them down. And note that a lot of the arguments that he goes against, they're with us today. A lot of people still uh, mount these arguments and try and show. So Locke then turns from a negative, shall we say, to a positive. Why do we believe a lot uh, in, in, in innate propositions? Or why do we have such strong beliefs? Locke says, look, there's all kinds of moral principles that, that we believe in. We believe them tenaciously. We, we, we grab onto them, we hang on to them, and we don't like giving them up. Why is that? Well, here Locke shifts to a little bit of what we would today called, call sociology. And he says something like this. Well, think about it. How, did, how, did, how were you raised as a child? How are most children raised? You're raised in a context of adults telling you things, basically drilling things into your head. Over and over, you hear the same stuff, you hear certain moral principles, things you should believe. If you're raised in a religion, you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going to be, uh, uh, you know, participating in the rituals of that religion, observing its doctrine, mem maybe memorizing its doctrine, maybe get, maybe taking tests on it, maybe getting accredited and like, yeah, your stages, you're, you're advancing through it, all kinds of things. So you're being completely cultured in it. You're you know, I don't want to say indoctrinated, but that's more or less what Locke is saying, is you're completely, you're being indoctrinated. So those beliefs you grow up with, they're in you, and they're, they're given to you by people you love and trust, your parents, uh, or, you know, whatever your family relationships may be, a beloved uncle, or, yeah, I learned all this stuff about my religion and my, and my morality, too. doesn't have to just be religion, can be morality. The way you view the world, how you view, you know, a little bit on the sort of the darker side, maybe how you view people of other cultures, you grow up with that, Locke says. That's powerful stuff. You grow up with this, you are fed this constantly, Locke says. Well, the child's entire way of thinking, from religion to moral principle, everything. That's a context of the, of the environment. That's a result, shall we say, a product of the environment that they grow up with. Now, think about it. If you grew up in a culture or in some kind of environment, you don't have many memories of how that all started. You just always grew up with these more, you just, sorry, you grew up with the, these moral principles, so your memory does not outrun the moral principles. When your memory starts, those moral principles are there, right? Yeah, some early memory, you know, I have of going to, to temple or church or, or, or praying or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, or, you know, maybe you were raised as, 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 uh, as an atheist, and so you have no live in contact with, uh, with religion. So you just always grew up in a household where moral, morals were said to be this and that and this way and had nothing to do with religion. So you will completely not make those associations. So Locke is saying, when you then introspect and you look at your memories, you don't have memories of learning this stuff. 
Maybe you have some memories of your uncle reinforcing it or your mom or your dad, but you don't really have memories of learning. You don't have a memory of not knowing and then coming to uh, acquire. So when you're asked, says Locke, where did this really come from? You'll ultimately say things like, well, probably God put this stuff there or they were, or they were natural or maybe nature embedded, right? You could have a, uh, have a secular view of the innatist view. Uh, of the mind, uh, you could say, well, maybe it wasn't stamped by God. Locke doesn't really look at that view, but it's possible you could say, well, no, I just was born with this kind of knowledge. Locke is saying that's a mistake because you forget. When you forget you've learned something, it's very easy to make an erroneous inference that I never actually learned it at all. I just knew this. So these things, this is picked up by many of the British empiricists. You'll find this kind of writing in the 19th century of John Stuart Mill. Mill says something quite nice. He says, the beliefs you grow up with, especially the moral ones, they get a, shall we say, a community a bestowed halo on them. You become where you're, you, you're doing what the community likes and the community says congratulations, pats you on the back for it. And those beliefs of how to behave and how to think, they acquire a halo. And so it's very easy to think, hence from the halo metaphor, that uh, they're ultimately divine in origin or impressed upon you by God's uh, will. So it's a natural error to move from don't remember learning to must be innate. So, and Locke also says, you know, when you think of it, the education and culture is extraordinarily powerful. Even if you do come to doubt your culture, doubt your beliefs, you're kind of in the position, you might be in the position sort of, of, of someone who's feeling that everything they grew up with is wrong, right? And Locke says, how many of us really dig down into our beliefs like that? How, and if we do, how many people really have the courage to stand up and go, everything, hey everybody, everything you guys have told me is wrong. Or everything you've told me is, a, you made it up, it's a fiction, right? Try that out. See how people react to that. Don't like it. Most people don't like being told that maybe what they believe their entire lives is a fiction. Or it's just been arrived at by being told that. And, and if you'd have been born elsewhere, you'd have the opposite. You could very well have the opposite set of views. So if you're born in one religious culture or one kind of culture, born in a different, you'd be totally different. Most of us don't like this kind of thing. Uh, we just rather settle back and go, no, it's more comfortable, it's easier just to stick with my beliefs and even uh, sink back into the uh, notion that they're innate. So examining your own belief is psychologically, says Locke, very difficult. Most people don't want to do it. And they're powerful so that they are hard to resist. And Locke says they're powerful that if you grow up, says, says Locke, you know, worshipping, uh, he uses examples of, of, you know, various animals. So he's trying to talk about certain kinds of, of religions. But the, the point, the general point he's trying to make is when you look at belief systems of other, ones other than your own and you're thinking, that is absurd. How can people believe that? Look at the context. If you grow up and everybody around you believes something, chances are you're going to believe it too, and you're going to cling to it, even if it strikes other people as absurd. And that's why when you do tell people, uh, you know, around you that our belief system is absurd, or some of the things we hold are absurd, or you go into another system and say, hey, what you guys think is absurd, people are extremely resistant. So it's hard to resist, and also it entrenches beliefs. Even absurd ones. Locke says if you, if you raise children with absurdities and you drive that into their heads, they're going to believe those absurdities as adults. So, again, don't get Locke wrong here. He's not reducing religion ultimately, shall we say, the, the, the questions of you know, the, the higher, more abstract ones about the question of the existence of the divine and all that. He's not saying that's just a cultural projection. 
He's just saying that we can just go off base all over the time because we don't have innate truth and we have to work with experience and reasoning. So we'd better get our reasoning right because if we don't, these kinds of forces will take over. Culture and, uh, and, and, and education, they can go seriously awry. So underneath all this is, uh, shall we say, bit of a, of, of, a, of a plea for tolerance, right? Maybe our beliefs that are so different, they could be examined, maybe repackaged, maybe reconsidered, and they might end up fitting together a little bit better when we start looking at them through this lens of education and culture. Uh, we might be saying, oh, well, that's maybe just the way I grew up. Maybe I don't have to think of God in that particular way. I might think of it, of it differently or, or somewhat uh, more like other people or, or whatnot. So he's trying to loosen and get us to examine uh, the things that we thought were innate, but no, they're the products of culture, reasoning, and whatnot. But we can, if we use our reason right, we can get to what Locke did think of uh, as the truth about God and God's existence. So he still has that traditional uh, dimension. So no principles are innate. What about ideas? Remember, ideas are a big thing for Locke. And Locke says, no, those aren't, uh, those aren't innate either. The, uh, the, the rest of, of, book, of, of this book, book one, uh, in chapter four, which, which we're not going to look at in detail, but chapter four goes into more details about how in ideas themselves, no, they're not innate. We saw a little bit about that when he said if an innate principle, if there is an innate principle, then the ideas that make it up have to be innate. Later on, he is going to look at uh, the possibility of innate ideas and say, nope, once again, those aren't innate either. But moral laws exist, no question. Just because they're not innate, they do exist. Moral laws are real. God is real. He's grounded all these moral laws. So the entire moral structure of the universe is just as real as logic. It's just as real as anything. It's true. It's not just a byproduct of culture. As a matter of fact, cultures sort of lead us away from truth. They're not the grounding of truth. The grounding of truth, once again, for Locke, is God. And how do we get there? Through experience and reasoning. No special insight. Plain, old-fashioned experience and reasoning. So now that the, uh, the, the principles and the ideas Locke thinks, you know, now that I've got you to the point, hopefully, says Locke, that you're convinced that uh, morals and speculative logic, all that stuff and ideas come from experience, it's time for Locke to turn to examining experience. And experience, the, the examination of it, begins with the examination of ideas. Stay tuned for that in the next video.